showed you how that the Christian operates in the realm of supernatural faith. The lost man operates in the realm of natural faith. The natural faith is the realm of the eyesight. What you see, what you can reason, what you can make sense of. The supernatural faith sees beyond the natural realm. It is able to believe the things that aren't understandable. Such as that in the beginning God said and it was so. Now science for generations has tried to explain and dismiss and undermine and deny, but the reality is if you are operating in the realm of the natural man, some of that's going to be hard to fathom. That's the reason spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Say amen. amen. There are things in this Bible that are just it's just plain. Thou shalt not commit murder. You don't have to be saved to understand that. That's very plain. But then there are some things in this Bible you'll never understand except God should give you discernment. Because it's not of this realm. So we've looked at the word of faith being the basis of our supernatural faith. That that faith that the Christian operates in is given to us by God. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You have no, you don't get to claim any credit for it. Say amen. amen. You don't get to take credit for it. You don't get to claim it as something you produced or that you manufactured. No, it was the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then we look today at the spirit of faith. How that that spirit of faith allows us to see beyond the temporal plane. That's why I say folk die different. I've been by the bedside of both many times. The saved and the lost. When you listen to this preacher, saved folk die different. Why? Because they're not seeing this world. They're looking beyond it. told about my grandmother, how the, the nurses were weeping and begging to give her pain medicine, and she would, with a smile, with a smile, pain racking her body, with a smile, she said, no, honey, I don't want anything clouding my mind when Jesus comes. Amen. See, that's supernatural faith. That's, that's looking to the other side. Amen? Amen. That's, that's having your affection set upon things above, not things of this world. Tonight, I want to finish, if the Lord would help us for just a minute. On the trial of faith and the end of faith. The trial and end of your faith. It might surprise you to know that your faith is going to end one day. Some people never even realize that. But our faith is not eternal. 
our faith has, I guess you'd say, an expiration date on it. I'm going to show you that. Take your Bibles, book of James. The book of James, we're going to start by explaining the trial of faith. The Bible teaches us that Christians who operate in the realm of supernatural faith should not be shocked, surprised, caught off guard, or dismayed when their faith is tried. That is where we operate. Where faith is tried. The Bible's full of it. How many times do we hear the Lord say, Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Why couldn't you just believe? Oh, ye of little faith. You see, God tries our faith because as He tries our faith, our, trade, our faith is given opportunity to grow. The evidence that we are not operating in faith like we should is that we are no longer anxious to pray for the great and mighty things that we know it's not. We get nervous when preachers start talking about asking God for big things. And yet He's a big God. Is he not? Yeah. This preacher's of the opinion that God's tired of being nickel and dime to death by his people. I believe he's looking for somebody. I believe he's looking for some folks, some churches that are once again believe that he is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Remember when we used to use that title? Remember when that was common, preacher? Folk referred to him as the Lord God Almighty. We don't hear that much anymore. <laughs> We don't pray big prayers much anymore. We pray little prayers. It's because we shun the trial of our faith. In fact, we work hard to keep from being in a trying moment. We would prefer, as we said the other night, we would prefer things go smooth. We like it when everything's working fine. And yet the Bible tells us and teaches us over and over and over that our faith will be tried. Now, that's not because God does not love us. Oh, contrary. He loves us enough to do what we would not do ourselves. Sort of like when you're raising young. Now, we've always had children in our home. Miss Terry teaches preschool kids right now. We fostered a bunch of children. We raised our own. We homeschooled our kids their entire education. And there's a change that's happened in the last good many years with young people. It amazes me their eating habits now. What do kids eat? <coughs> Put some pot roast on the table and a bowl of beans and some mashed potatoes and some corn and look at their face when it's time to eat. <laughs> but now if you put pizza or, you know, uh, tater tots or, you know, chicken nuggets. chicken nuggets. Thank you, sis. Chicken nuggets. <laughs> That's a scary thing. I've processed a lot of chickens in my day. I've yet to figure out where they get that from. It's basically parts. I told you, it's a scary thought. I don't even want to know what the parts are. But you understand what I'm saying. Kids don't know how to eat anymore. Won't even try it. Won't even try it. Let me tell you how it was when I grew up. I grew up poor. We didn't have a whole lot. We, we had, I had a goodly raisin. I mean, we never went hungry. We never did without. But we didn't have a lot. But listen, going to get a hamburger was a huge deal when I was growing up. I mean, that was a, that was a big deal. My mama always cooked our meal. She put a bowl of beans on the table. She put a bowl of potatoes on the table and she'd put some meat on the table and there'd be a jar of chow chow and a jar of pickles and 
and, and the table would be filled with food. And here's the rule at our house when I was growing up. You need a helping of everything my mama cooked. The words, I don't like that, <laughs> that was never uttered at our table. You say, what was the outcome? I like greens. <laughs> Try to get you young and see that now. Just fix your big old pot of collard greens. And when it's supper time, set them down to a bowl of collard greens and see how they do. I'll tell you what happened. It worked because I like greens. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I, I like them all. Turn greens, collard greens, kale, spinach. I, hey, I like them all. Mixed greens. Listen, when I was a boy, I told you about my grandma living with us. This little mountain woman. I'll tell you this real quick and we'll get to the message. I was a teenage boy. Like I said, I helped care for my grandma. She called me over to her one day and she said, Chris, honey, I want you to take me outside in the yard. She said, I've got a taste for some, some greens. We're going to go out there and pick a mess of greens. I got my grandma outside in a wheelchair. She'd tell me, over there, son. And I'd go over and she'd say, pick that right there. And she'd over here, son. And I'd push her over and she'd pick that right there. And we picked a mess of greens out of our yard. I thought I had the coolest grandma on the planet. I did. I said, have mercy, look at that. I didn't even know we had groceries in the yard. And grandma, just like that, said, I got a taste for greens. Let's go get some. Listen to me. Your faith is sort of like raising them youngins. We started shying away from having our faith tried. Now we don't like green. You'll put two and two together here in a second. We stopped allowing God to put us in those situations where we would have to rely on faith. Amen. Amen. And instead, like a little spoiled youngin', we said, I don't like that. And so we wouldn't do it. But now we're weak in faith. We don't pray great prayers. I don't, I'm not talking about eloquent. It always tickles me how people try to impress God with their vocabulary. <laughs> we just don't ask the great and mighty things anymore. Pray little prayer. So let's look at the trial of faith. James chapter 1. <coughs> James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren. Now, let me help you this evening. Anytime you see the word brethren in your Bible, you need to tune in because that's addressed to somebody. That's not junk mail. That has an address on it. Brethren. That's addressed to you and I who are saved. <clears throat> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. This word divers simply means different as in diverse. Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations knowing this. Here's what I want you to understand now. When we read in verse 2, my brethren, count it. What that is telling us is this is a mathematical certainty. <clears throat> Think about it. He says, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. And then he says, knowing this. This isn't something we're guessing about. This isn't something that we're waiting to find out or wondering if it's true. He said, hey, it's a mathematical certainty. You just add it up. Just count it up. It's a mathematical certainty. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And that's where everybody takes a gasp and says, oh, oh. you'll hear them say, say, oh, don't pray for patience. Oh, don't pray for patience. Why not? You need to read the rest of it. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting 
nothing, that's a pretty good place to be. That's a pretty good place to live your life right there. Wanting nothing. How many of us, I don't need to show hands, just answer in. I wonder how many of us can say, preacher, that's where I live. That's where I live, right there, preacher. I'm perfect, entire, and wanting nothing. And this word perfect's not talking about perfection. It's talking about complete. Can I help you tonight? There's a whole lot of God's people aren't complete because they're afraid of having their patience increased and their faith tried. Amen. Therefore, they're not complete. That's the reason Paul cautioned and warned them. said, look, you're just babes. You, you, you're still on the bottom. You still desire the sincere milk of the word. You ought to be in, enduring strong meat by now. See, I believe we're in the falling away. That's right, brother. I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced the church is in this period of apostasy where truth is rejected. <coughs> Folk now no longer endure sound up. I can remember hard preaching. I'm talking about the preacher loosening his collar, take his coat off, and sweat three rows back. Yeah. <laughs> Preach against everything. Some of it probably shouldn't even been preaching against, but it felt good, I reckon. I'm talking about hard preaching now. And folk endured it. They kept coming. They didn't bow up at the preacher. They didn't get mad and leave church. They, they cheer him on and say things like, Amen! Preach! Preacher, preach! And now, we sit and stare at our phones and our watches and count the seconds till we can leave. And oh, the preacher does get to preaching hard. If he does nail something down tight, then they'll get bowed up and say, Well, I'm not going back. And I'm telling you the truth tonight, church. I've been at this a while. <coughs> We're living in the last days. That's right, brother. We're living in the period of the falling away of the church. You see, apostasy is not ignorance. It's not a lack of knowledge. It's rejection of truth. You know it. You just reject it. Yeah. It's not that you're ignorant of it or you've not been informed of it. Oh, you're, you're aware. You just reject it. Yeah. It's like what our country's doing right now. I'm a patriot. I was raised in a patriot's home. I love America. I've served my country. My daddy was a Marine. My mom was a, a whack. That's not a political uh, acceptable term now. It stands for Women's Army Corps. My mom was in the Army. I come from a patriot's home. And I still love America. And I hate what she's become. Murdering babies. Defying the God of heaven. Say, preacher, you're depressing us now. Well, don't be depressed. We're going to see how this thing ends in just a moment. You see, let patience have her perfect work. That you may be in perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So this word patience is defined in this manner by Noah Webster. Suffering of afflictions pain, toil, calamity, or other evil, listen to this, with a calm, unruffled temper, endurance without murmuring. Amen. That's patience. Endurance without murmuring. Keep referencing my grandma. Constant pain. I told you she never murmured and complained. She just talked about how good Jesus is. Amen. I can remember her going to church with Grandma. She had crippling rheumatoid arthritis. She was all twisted up. Her hands were all fingers twisted and all. And She had a pocketbook about the size of a knapsack. Great, big old thing. <laughs> and it was because she could open it up and, and, and reach in. It was big enough she could get in there and get things. And I can see it just like yesterday. My grandma would be in church and 
Boy, God get the blessing her, and you'd see her start to fish around in that big old pocketbook. She'd pull out one of them lace hankies. Boy, you could tell, uh-oh, it's fixing to get on. And she <laughs> And man, she'd get to waving that hanky and get to praising God. She didn't care if the president was in there. I'm trying to tell you something tonight. If we get back to operating the realm of faith. This Christian life you're living will have a whole different tone to it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It'll become way more than low living and sight walking. Turn with ahead just a little bit, if you would. Look in 1 Peter chapter 1, just a few pages ahead. 1 Peter chapter 1. <coughs> trial and end of our faith. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter chapter 1, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. Amen. <coughs> when I ask tonight, do you have a reservation? That's what it says. Reserved in heaven for you. Do you have a reservation? Amen. I do. Do you? Miss Faye, you got a reservation? I got a reservation. My name's in the book. Amen. You'll figure it out here in just a second. I'm in the reservation book. Amen. You ever go to one of them restaurants where you've made a reservation, you walk up, they say, may we help you? And you say, yes, I have a reservation. Well, they do. They start looking through the book. Your name, please. You tell them, they go down to that. Oh, yes, right here. We've got you right here. Isn't it a good feeling? It's way better than, than to go down there and say, we're sorry, you're not in the book. But I made a reservation. Can't see it. <clears throat> it's not in the book. I'm afraid you're not going to be able to stay tonight. Do you have a reservation? Peter said reserved in heaven for you. It's personal. It won't be a cattle drive. Not some kind of roundup. You're not going to get herded up, shoved in. No, it's personal. Reserved in heaven for you. It's a personal thing. You won't ride in on daddy's coattails. It's personal. Go on with me just a little bit. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Why would God make us endure trials of faith? <clears throat> it's for his glory. Amen. It's what it says here, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. See, when we try to avoid or skirt and exclude ourselves from the trial of faith. We rob God of an opportunity to receive honor and glory for our ease and comfort. Think about that. <clears throat> the pages of history are covered 
with the blood of the martyrs. History records thousands of names and places and peoples who for the cause of Christ would not, would not forsake the Lord. Burned at the stake, fed to lions for heathens' entertainment, slaughtered in the gladiator pit. And here in this day, we think if somebody makes fun of us, we're suffering for Jesus. You don't have to turn there. Let me just flip back and remind you what I'm talking about. We started in Hebrews 11 Friday night. We'll go back there. You don't have to turn. I'm just going to read a few verses to make sure you understand what I'm talking about. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, the same to do, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, and after they were passed about seven days. By faith the heart of Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? <clears throat> For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, Jephthah, of David also, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. The trial of faith is not to destroy you and I. It's not to make our lives harder or more difficult or for us to be discouraged. No, no, no. It's an opportunity for God to be put on display. Amen. For this lost and dying world, seeing God work in the lives of His people, we've spent far too many years trying to avoid it. In fact, if it just starts to get a little hard, we start complaining and wanting to know why things aren't better. It doesn't even have to be like I read in Hebrews 11. None of us here have faced anything like that. Yet, I'll raise my hand. I've been guilty of complaining. Am I the only one? I doubt it. I find it hard to believe I'm the only one that's ever been caught complaining a little bit. Shame on us. Shame on us. You see, the trial of faith is that God may be praised and honored and glorified. Go on with me. Verse 8, 1 Peter chapter 1. Whom having not seen, you love. And whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. <coughs> so what's, what's the end of our faith? I hope you understand a little better the trial of faith. If you look at verse number 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now in verse 8, the Bible says, Whom having not seen you love, talking about the Lord, and whom though now you see not yet believing, 
You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. This word unspeakable just means you cannot express it. We don't have the capacity. We try. Songwriters have penned songs in an effort to talk about this Savior of ours, how wonderful he is. But can I say to you this evening, we have all failed to adequately express how good he is. Our best efforts fall so short because it's unspeakable. You, you and I don't have the ability to express just how good he is. So how do we get it accomplished, preacher? We let him do it himself in the trial of faith. That's what my grandma was doing all those years she was in pain. She didn't murmur and complain. She didn't brag about how good Jesus is. Here her grandson is all these years later. And I'm still affected by what I saw in my grandma as a boy. I'm still affected. I still know, based on what I saw in her life, fourth grade education, I'm still affected by what I saw in my grandma's life. And it is to God's glory and to God's honor and to God's praise. And a fourth grade educated old mountain woman pulled it off. How'd she do it, preacher? It was unspeakable, so she just let the trial of faith do the talking. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So in verse 7, we found the trial of your faith. In verse 9, we received the end of your faith. I said that your faith will end. Most people have never thought about faith enough to realize that it's got an expiration date. We just think that we'll always have faith. Not so. When's it going to end, preacher? When is this end of your faith going to happen? When you receive the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, when we graduate this life and go on, There'll be no need for faith. I don't have to believe that he is. I'll be in his presence. I won't have to have the Bible to read and to believe the word of God because I have to go by something that I have no physical evidence of, only God's word about. No, no, no. I won't need faith on the other side. It'll all be before me. That street of gold we've read about, guess what? I won't need faith to believe in it. Right. I'll walk on it. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You see, the trial of faith is for this side. Because of the end of our faith, it will all be complete. I've got news for you. Ten years ago, you think you're meant. Make sure I'm telling this right. Do the quick math. Nine plus years ago, I buried my dad. You know what I believe he's doing today? My grandma's name is Mary. And grandma and me, my daddy referred to her as Mary. You know what I believe my daddy's doing, brother? I believe him and my grandma might just be strolling around. Amen. Amen. Enjoying the reward of their faith. Whenever my turn comes, I don't know. I believe it might be something like this. Last time I saw my grandma, she couldn't walk. But I believe next time I see her, she'd be able to grab me by the hand and say, Come on, boy, I got some stuff to show you. Yeah. Okay. 
I can just hear it. You remember all that stuff we talked about? I was in that wheelchair and he was pushing me around. Look at here. It's real. We need to get our eyes above this plane. Amen. We need to stop worrying about this old life. We let it rob us, folks. We let this old wicked world rob us. We've lost our joy. We've lost our victory. People look at us and they don't see anything they want. When we ought to be bringing glory and honor and praise to the Lord. Amen. I want to ask you tonight. I'm, I'm done preaching. I want to ask you tonight. Would it scare you to death? God considered you. Talk about Job now. Remember when he told Satan, had he considered the servant of Job? What a thing that God would literally invite the devil to take a shot at one of his young. I wonder tonight if God could consider us. Old devil said, well, of course he's going to praise you. My goodness, look how good you've been to him. God said, that's not why he is faithful, why he praises you. Well, then take it all away. I'll get him to curse you. God said, okay. We'll take it all away. God said, you can do everything you want to except kill him. Kill you look at what Job faced in the days to come. I don't know anybody that would deny that's a trial of faith. How did he handle The Lord give it, the Lord takes the blessing. Bless it. Be the name of the Lord. He didn't murmur and complain. Let the trial of faith speak for itself. I want to encourage you tonight. I don't believe things are going to get better. I'm not a doomsday kind of guy. I am a realist. We have a wicked government. I don't believe we're going to see better days. I believe we're going to see worse days. But don't get discouraged. Do you? Don't get depressed and defeated and stick your head in the sand. No, no, no. But acknowledge that God, if the trial of faith comes my way, help me to stand. Help me to not murmur. But help me to be a source of praise, honor, and glory for you. Because it's just for a while. Yeah. And then the end of our faith which we'll stand on the other side and rejoice forevermore. I used to do prison work years ago. There was revivals of state and federal prisons all over America. <coughs> right down to death row. I had a man ask me one time, I was in a prison, visiting cell to cell. When all you've got is time, in a Bible, you can come up with some questions. Little boys would ask you some stuff. They'd just sit in there day after day pondering things. And they'd ask you things like, wow. This old boy asked me, he said, Preacher, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. Don't know that I have the answer, but you can ask it. <coughs> he said, when we die, the same, we're going to heaven, right? I said, that's right. He said, that's going to be forever, right? I said, correct. Eternity. It's a long, long time. He said, like forever, never, 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 never. Millions and millions and millions of years. I said, well, actually, there won't be any need for millions of years because it's never going to stop. So it's just going to be forever. He said, okay, I thought that was so. He said, my question is this. After we've been there 10 million years, what's going to keep heaven from growing old? 
They said, my goodness, you only walked the street of gold so many times. <coughs> he said, I'm sure it's impressive the first few thousand years. He said, but I don't know. I'm just wondering how it's not going to grow old after a while. <coughs> it's actually a pretty good question. <coughs> I pondered in a moment. I said, I believe I know what it is. He said, what's that? I said, I believe about the time that you think you're going to start getting bored. You're going to start getting over it, so to say. I said, I believe God's going to uncover another facet of his being and the shout will be on for another million years. Yeah. Listen to me. This is just for a while. But what's to come? Oh, my. Forever is a long, long time. Forever is a long, long time. Brother, you can.